Right, it's the leadership, the leadership forum time, and of course, today we want to train our focus on halftime. Right, it's all about the transitions of life. Life transitions are sharp discontinuities with the previous life events. They have ident identifiables uh, beginnings, turning points, and their endings. Coping skills learned earlier are mobilized during transitions to help the person manage the transition process. A process conception of transition includes a series of stages from entry through final resolution and growth. The primary dynamic is the process of letting go of the old value, relationship or belief to taking hold of a new one. Coping skills consisting of support networking, cognitive restructuring, problem solving and stress management are key mediating variables that determine the cost of or the cost and emotional intensity of the transition. This is what we are focusing on this morning. And of course, uh, we have our panelists here in studio with us who will take us through this co particular conversation. And of course, also I drew a lot of inspiration, or we've drawn a lot of inspiration from this book by Bob Bafford, Halftime, Moving from Success to Significance. And he's actually talking about that analogy that uh, he's using is about the football game, where we have the first half and the second half. And sometime we need to take time off from the pitch to strategize, to reevaluate our play, and to see if what we're doing can make us be successful in the next phase of life. And this is how many of us are playing our life in the pitch. Are we just going on and on with the same strategy without taking time off to think? Or are we just always flying by wire? Or we are on autopilot, right? Where you don't take time to reflect try and internalize and deeply go through the deepest recesses of your heart to see if truly your life is taking the trajectory that you had anticipated. This is what we want to discuss this morning. Halftime, the transitions of life. How are you dealing with your halftime? Many of you, maybe you're in, at that point in life where you feel like, yes, I've achieved it all, but what is next for me? What is the next step? What should I be doing, right? All the goals that I had, they've checked out from the list. And, and right now I feel like, yes, this is success. But now I'm moving on to significance. And I think also that was a topic of a debate where people were saying the appointment of the right Honorable Raila Odinga was all about life or self-actualization, right? You're coming from success to significance. And everyone is aspiring to be significant at some point. When we have all these trappings of life around you, you feel like you need more. But what is that more? And what are you doing about that more that you want to achieve? Allow me to introduce you this morning. I'd done this earlier at the top of the hour with Dr. Vincent Ogutu, who is of us, Chancellor Designate of Strathmore Business School. Also, we have Dr. Sisa Mwangi with us this morning, who is the Executive Director of Center for Personal Leadership. We have Daisy M. Danny, who is a policy uh, uh, advisory and, of course, also re-elected now. Tell us more about this new development, uh, Daisy M. Danny. Well, you, um, you know that uh, the, the, the organization for which I am the executive director, yes. the Crown Trust, hosts the National Women's Steering Committee. And uh, we were just uh, given a renewed mandate the day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. And of course, I am the coordinator. It's a platform that brings together several different organizations from around the country that work in women's empowerment and women's advancement. Mm -hmm. mm. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And of course, also, we're receiving bad news about uh, Jen uh, Kiano, who's a former Mindelea Yawanake chair, yes. uh, who died uh, in Nairobi. She died at 10.25 uh, p.m. at the Nairobi Hospital on Thursday night after a long battle with cancer. A big blow, uh, of course, for the women movement in the country as well. And I think so. Mm -hmm. It's very, very sad. In fact, uh, when we had our meeting, we actually got news that uh, she had been taken into the ICU. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, it's a very sad, it's a very sad time. Um, we remember Auntie Jane very fondly. Um, she is a woman who was very passionate about the empowerment of women. Mm -hmm. And she used her position uh, as the chair of Mindeleo to do many things that today stand women in good stead. We remember her. Mm -hmm. She was an iconic leader for Mindeleo Yawanawake. Yes. 
Yes. Um, and really put the issues of women within the executive discussion, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. using her proximity to power yes. to actually advocate for women. Mm -hmm. um, w later on, she is one of the people that we used to sit with very often. And I remember last year, she actually called me and said, look, we need to actually sit and, and, and have lunch. She took us for lunch together yes. with my colleague and we were discussing the issues of women and she was like, you know, the way things are going, mm -hmm. we seem to be losing so much uh, when we have frameworks that we <coughs> fought for. And she was determined that we really need to do something to come back together mm -hmm. and find a way to bridge the divide uh, that has now, you know, sort of like scattered the the momentum for women in the country. So it's sad and, and the quality, the caliber of women that Jane Keanu was, mm -hmm. Um, we really hope that we can re we can have more women like that because mm -hmm. she was really a leader, a mother, and I wish that we had given her opportunity to do a lot more. Mm -hmm. But you know, in Kenya, we we like to praise then people and see their potential when they are no longer around. But posthumously, right? Yes, thank you but very she, much. But she she definitely did a lot, and mm -hmm. she will be missed. Right. We are deeply missed as well. And of course, uh, that is uh, the news also uh, trickling in in our studios this morning. Jen uh, Keanu, former Maindeleo Yawanawake chair, uh, died in uh, Nairobi Hospital yesterday night. She died at 10, 25 p.m. And of course, after a long battle with cancer, may the good Lord rest her soul in eternal peace. And of course, this also is a big month uh, where cancer awareness also is you know, being sensitized, people should go for testing, especially breast cancer, if you've not really gone for your mammogram. And, uh, you know, that just the rigors of testing that really goes with the cancer, then you should do that. Allow me to introduce to you this morning as, as well, Vincent Kimosop, who is uh, the chief consultant of uh, Sovereign Insights. Good morning. Morning to you. And thank you for joining us today. I uh, appreciate you. Thank you. Right, let, let's just uh, go deeply into what we're discussing today. And of course, I've just mentioned uh, the halftime book that has drawn the inspiration for this particular conversation. The need for going through life and taking stock of where we are going. Uh, we had from Vincent uh, at the top of the hour. Let's just hear also from uh, uh, Dr. Cesar Mwangi, halftime. When you talk about halftime and the transitions of life, what really comes to mind? Yeah. I want to say this book specifically talks about halftime. But I, all, I, I, my view is that we should always, not only at halftime, but all the time, mm -hmm. be evaluating what we are doing. Uh, so we don't have to wait for halftime. But I know the book focuses on the fact that we are often in the middle of a mad rush for success for a given period of time of our lives, which is the first half, mm -hmm. as the book says. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we achieve that success. We get to the top of the mountain, which we've been very busy climbing. And we get to the top and we ask, what next? Is this all there is? And there is that lack of fulfillment because we pursued material things, we pursued fame and fortune, but we didn't pursue a meaningful existence. Mm -hmm. So as we are busy making a living, we forget to make a life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the book is saying. And I think it is so true for many of us because there's this mirage out there we are chasing called success. And we are chasing it and chasing it and chasing it until a point where we realize we're never going to get it because every time we get closer, we get something that we think is going to make us successful. Mm -hmm. We realize we're not fulfilled. And I think, therefore, instead of saying, let's wait for half time, let us be people who are continuously examining ourselves, perhaps on a daily basis, perhaps on a weekly basis, perhaps on a monthly basis, and asking, what is my life about? Many people, as we are now hearing, even in this country, say, I want to leave my legacy. You should not think about your legacy late in life. You should be thinking about your legacy all the time so that it guides you in the actions you take in the present. So I'm saying it's a real phenomena, it's a true phenomena, it's a common phenomena, but we need to change it around slightly mm -hmm. and make it not half time but all the time. Right. <laughs> Dr. Vincent, not half time but all the time. Uh, I, I agree with Caesar that the main thing is uh, significance, purpose. So quite often we find ourselves chasing after what other people define as success. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going for. Until we discover later on that that isn't 
success for us. That each of us has a destiny, yes. each of us has a purpose why we're here, and it's different from the purpose that other people have. And as long as you're veering off that purpose and living someone else's dream, following someone else's definition of success, then you're a failure, actually. And then the minute you start living your purpose, what you're here for, now that's what real success uh, tastes like. And in fact, what Bob Dufford says is, at halftime, the sort of questions you should be asking yourself are, what is my thing? What is that singular thing that I'm here for, mm -hmm. that all my gifts are for, that everything I did before prepares me to do? And then just focus on that. And that's when you get significance, when you do the one thing that brought you here, your, your single purpose in life. So I think it's very important for people to step back and say, what game am I playing? What rules am I following? Whose definition of success am I following? Can I stop, pause, think about that, find my purpose, and start measuring myself against that purpose? How successful am I in living my true purpose in life? Thank you. All right, let's hear from Daisy. Well, um, I want to agree with the two gentlemen, and I want to agree very, very strongly that um, life is always moving. And so it shouldn't just be about half time. It actually should be, as Caesar says, all the time. We must always take time to reflect. But you know, we need to learn. We need to, it's a discipline that we must adopt. And when you're reflecting, you have to be reflecting on something. You have to determine in yourself, who is it that I am first? Because it's pointless to reflect when you have no idea who you are. You've no idea what your purpose is. You, 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 have, no, you have no goals. So you know, you can take time out to rest, you know, just to rest mm -hmm. and continue doing all the wrong things. So it's important to center yourself in terms of who am I, what am I here to do? But aside from that, you know that we are all on this journey called life. And many times we don't understand that we will actually have to account for our existence. I know there are those people who believe in annihilation that once you're past this life, that's it. You don't have to account. Mm -hmm. But you know, for me, I am of the opinion that we, and I believe that we will have to account for this life that we have been given. Each one of us is born with giftings and talents to make us productive and useful in this life mm -hmm. and in this world that we live, to be able to make a contribution and more so a positive contribution. If you have not discovered that purpose, what are you measuring yourself against? Because then you're measuring yourself against what other people have defined you as or what they have defined as your life. Mm -hmm. So it's really important Thank you. for us to have this to even in terms of de-stressing, you know, because when you're in a situation where you're doing that which you're, is not what you're supposed to be doing, not what you're called to, not what you're tailored for, you find yourself going against a grain, many people ending up in depression, suicide, you know, thank it's you. not good for your mental health. Right, thank so you. Yeah, we'll have opportunities to very, actually very elaborate today. It is, it's, Lastly, it's important. Right, thank you, thank you. Daisy, from Vincent, briefly, um, then we'll take a short break. Um, thanks, Debao. Uh, I think uh, if you would allow me to pass my message of condolences to the Kianos since it has broken when we are here and uh, pray for the family in this period. It's our prayers and thoughts are with them. Uh, then coming to the topic of the day, uh, I would uh, say that uh, there is enough space in the air for every bird to fly. Mm -hmm. And we need to appreciate that with that in mind, uh, the, the shift from... I can only become better when somebody does not have. Yes. The, there's so much emphasis of, uh, uh, as in the level and the measure of your worth or your success in the physical. Mm -hmm. And forgetting that, hey, um, there is uh, more to life. The, the, when we quote today people like Miles, Miles Munro, yes. uh, we do not quote uh, the jets, we do not quote the, 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 the buildings or the physical things that they were known for but uh, the opinions they were able to shape, the, 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 the dimensions and perspectives to issues that they brought, the yes. clarity on matters that they brought to the table. And that you can actually equate uh, to the deliberates and the intentionality that they lived on a reflective journey. Dibal, when we were in primary uh, school, 
we used to have something called a report card. Mm -hmm. Why has it was, it was uh, so driven and oriented towards uh, the academic, how much you got uh, or the marks that you had, it gave an indication of how, how, uh, how you're doing. If we were to enhance such a concept in terms of ensuring that we give the holistic view of a human being, right, but from the, the, the physical uh, to the academic, in all spaces, then I would actually uh, uh, equate uh, what uh, uh, the, the right of uh, halftime actually mirrors in our context on the need of uh, taking steps periodically. Thank because you. the summary of it all uh, then gives us uh, uh, the, the equation of how you walk the journey of life. Right. Welcome back. You're watching the Leadership Forum here on AM Live. And this morning we are talking about halftime, the transitions of life. How do you deal with the transitions of life? And of course we promise to circle back with our panelists now giving their views on the lectern regarding this particular topic at hand, halftime, transitions of life. And right now we have Dr. Cesar Mwangi, who is the executive director of Center for Personal Leadership, who will actually take us through that particular session. He has five minutes beginning now to talk to us on the transitions of life. Dr. Caesar. Thank you very much. Good morning, Kenya. And just as one of my colleagues offered their condolences to the Kano family, I also prefer my condolences to the Kano family and the loss of their matriarch, Mrs. Jane Kiano. Halftime, transitions of life. Life begins at birth and ends at death. And this particular book we're referring to is talking about half time when somebody perhaps ought to think about the meaning of their life. When I read snippets of this book, I remembered a story which I had read in another book called The Heart of Success. And I've never forgotten that little story which I want to share because I love stories and they help us conceptualize issues. This story was told of a young man who, whose father was extremely successful, a very successful businessman in the United States, and uh, he was the only son in that family. So he was taken to the best schools. And eventually, after finishing school, he went into work, and he eventually went to one of the leading universities in the United States at the time. Uh, I think it was Stanford, or one of those Ivy League universities. And he was going to do a master's in business administration in one of these great schools. And when he went to the school, the first thing he did was he went to the library. And when he went to the library, I think it was the second day after arriving there, he spent a long time in the library going through the bookshelves. And he was looking for a particular book. And one of the professors who was doing some research in the library observed him and called him and asked him, I've seen you going through this library for the last two, three hours. What are you looking for? What book are you looking for? You seem to be looking for a particular book. And the young man said, I'm looking for a book on success. And the professor asked him, why are you looking for a book on success? He said, well, my father was possibly one of the most successful businessmen in this country. He led a huge corporation and made a lot of money. He was extremely successful. Everybody said my father was extremely successful. But I was his son, and I don't think he was successful. And the professor asked him, why do you say if, in your view your father was not successful? And the young man said, because I hardly ever saw my father. I did not know my father. He did not spend any time with me. And he died, uh, and he's gone. And I'm still disturbed by the fact that people claim you're successful. I don't think you're successful. So I want to seek what is true success and how to find that book that will help me. And I think this book, Halftime, is struggling with that concept of success. What is success? We look at our context in this country. Success means becoming as rich as possible, as fast as possible, without telling people how exactly you're making that wealth, and then flaunting that wealth for people and possibly getting into politics and using that wealth to buy yourself and your way into power. Uh, that is one definition of success which I've seen, which is very dominant in our country. The shortest way to make money is success. And sometimes this is referred to as the rat race. It is actually an unexamined way of succeeding and eventually 
when you get to the top and earn all that big money and have all those assets and fly all those helicopters, perhaps you will reach a point where you'll ask yourself the question, what next? And that is the point of halftime. And that is often the point people reach where they reflect. And I want to suggest, perhaps, that it is a big mistake to live what I call an unexamined life, where we live judging ourselves by the standards of others, and those standards are purely material standards. There is something beyond the material. There is something spiritual. Because every human being born is not just a material person, is also a spiritual person. And if we ignore that spiritual part and grade ourselves, not only by what is on the outside, but by what is the inside, we lose a significant part of our life. There are issues, there are questions that we need to ask ourselves. For example, we need to ask ourselves, who am I? Who am I really? Yes, my name is Cesar Mwangi, but who am I really? And I think at the core of that matter, in my view, we should realize we are not just whom we think we are. We are children of God. And that is one very important part, that beyond us there is a spiritual life and there is a creator who is spirit, who created us. And sometimes if we only remember that, we will live a better life. Secondly, we need to ask ourselves, why am I here? Why on earth was I born? Was I born just to make money? Just to go to school, work hard, get good grades, and then get a good job, and then make as much money as I can? A friend of mine many years ago asked me, Caesar, now that you've got a good job, what next? And I told him, well, I think I may get married. What next? Have some children. What next? Buy a house. What next? Well, those questions really helped me, and those were asked me many years ago. And I'm so glad that friend of mine, his name is Andrew, I must mention his name, he asked me those questions, and I think it helped me examine my life and to start thinking, what is my life about? Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? Ultimately, what kind of life shall I live? What kind of life shall you live that will make that life meaningful, that will make that life happy, that will make that life be one that is of significance, as this book has pointed out, rather than just a life that was lived without examining. This concept of happiness, of success, of fulfillment, of meaningfulness has even been taken to the national sphere where we find countries asking themselves, yes, we're pursuing GDP, the gross domestic product, but there's something more important than that. And there's one country I really love reading about. It's a country called Bhutan. And they came up with a concept called gross national happiness, where they're asking, even if our people earn, get so much material things through our gross domestic product or our gross national product, even if we get well off, we have huge growths in our economy, if our people are not happy, then it is meaningless growth. And they came up with this concept of gross national happiness, which I really appreciate. And perhaps it is time that we as Kenyans started asking ourselves, yes, we are chasing material standards. We are chasing 10% economic growth rates. But are our people happier? We have disturbing stories where we are hearing the depression rates are increasing. We have disturbing stories that tell us mental, mental, mental problems are increasing. We have disturbing stories that tell us suicide rates are increasing. There is something wrong even if we are growing materially. And I suggest we really need to examine this concept of halftime, examining ourselves and asking ourselves, are we really having meaningful, happy lives in our country and at an individual level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Of course, uh, giving us also his insight about, yes, what is the transition of life? Where are we at? If we take our gross domestic uh, happiness index, then how will we fare as a country? Good question, and of course, uh, a good insight there from Dr. Sisa Mwangi. Up next, we have Dr. Vincent Ogutu, who is a vice chancellor. Right? You don't have to actually to check your mic because that is a lapel mic. You can just walk over to uh, the lectern. He's a vice chancellor of uh, Strathmore Business School, uh, vice chancellor designate, and of course, he's going to talk to us also as well on the transitions of life. So, we had a good take from uh, Dr. C. Zumwangi, and I can see also Samuel Orutwe is saying here on social media that nobody can intentionally change a legacy, but as much as you can be humble, work hard to 
serve people in whatever position you are at or it doesn't matter in public or in private any appreciation you receive and leave behind for people to remember is your greatest legacy that is Samuel Rutwa who is also commenting on social media Vincent Oguti is on the lectern right now let's hear from him good morning Kenyans if you are like me then you love underdogs and you love comebacks and this is something that we've seen in so many games that at halftime look like a lost game, somebody's losing, and then you have that incredible comeback in the second half from the underdogs. For me, the one that epitomizes this whole concept is the game in 2005, the UEFA Cup Finals between AC Milan and Liverpool. So Liverpool in that particular game were the underdogs. They had done so poorly in the league that their only chance of being in the Champions League that very next year was if they win this particular Champions League, which was an uphill task because AC Milan were on top of their game. They had incredible players like Maldini, Kaká, Pirlo, and it looked impossible to beat them. In fact, in the first half, AC Milan were up 3-0, and even their defender, Maldini, scored. That's just how good they looked. Liverpool looked over. I was watching it with an Irish friend of mine, and he decided he was leaving, so he left at halftime. And then I had to go look for another place where people were watching the game to watch the second half. And then later on, the next morning, when I tell him Liverpool won, he could not believe it. And that's just the nature of comebacks, of the underdogs not giving up on themselves. And the secret is halftime. So as Bob Bufford says, at halftime, you have to take stock. What happened? Is it over? Is it truly over? And you'll often find that it isn't. There's something you can correct. There's something you can learn from what happened in the past. And as long as you're still alive, as long as you've still got breath in you, you can fight and make a comeback. Now, what's the greatest comeback of all time? I want you to pause and think about that. You're probably thinking of some game, maybe a political campaign, maybe a military campaign where some people were losing and then they won. But what I believe is the greatest comeback of all time is something that happened at the crucifixion. We know that Jesus Christ was crucified. We also know that two other people were crucified on his left and on his right. And they were both thieves. And historically, they've come to be known as the good thief and the bad thief. What was the bad thief doing? Taunting Jesus, saying, if you are the Christ, come down from the cross and take us down with you and you know, save us as well. So he was basically saying, you're useless, look at you, here you are. You're not even as powerful as people said you are. And what did the good thief do? So the good thief tells the other one, shut up. You know that we deserve to be here after the life we've lived and everything we've done. And this man, he's, he doesn't deserve to be here. We know he's here because of political reasons, because of people who hated him, and he's just a much better man than any of us. And so you just shut up and leave him alone. And then he turns to Jesus and he says, you know, I, I actually believe in your kingdom, much as people disbelieve you right here. So when you get to that kingdom, please remember me. And then Jesus turns to him and says, this very day you will be with me in paradise. Now, I like to play this out in my imagination. So Jesus dies, the good thief dies, the bad thief dies, and for the first time in history, the gates of heaven are opened. Remember, they could not be opened until that salvation moment. So not even Adam, Eve, Moses, Abraham, none of those guys had gone to heaven. Then the doors of heaven opened for the first time, and people are expecting Moses, Abraham to show up, you know, on the right next to Jesus. Then he shows up with this guy. And the angels know this guy, like, that guy? This guy? What? He says, yeah, yeah, he'll be the first one to enter. He says, why? He says, because he redeemed himself in the last minute. I mean, he, the second half of his life, which was just an hour or two, he outperformed everything he had ever done in the first half of his life just by the way he lived the last two hours of his life. So that's why I love that word, redemption because you should never give up. 
As long as, like I said, there's breath left in you, and literally for this guy, there was very little breath left in him, literally. But he used it well. He could have just spared his breath and just suffered in peace. But he spoke out against the bad thief, defended Jesus, and then made the biggest, boldest move in his career of just, you know, let me just, let me just try my luck. Let me say, look, remember me when you come to the kingdom. I know I'm, I didn't live the greatest life, but here I am. I'm trying to undo the damage I did in the last two hours of my life for whatever it's worth. Remember me. And he was remembered. He's the first, according to me, the first human being who walked into heaven after Jesus Christ. And it's the biggest comeback of all time, according to me. So what I think about halftime is don't give up on yourself. Look at the past and think about it as a lesson. Yesterday I had a student in my office and she was crying about some mistakes she had made in her life. And I was telling her, it's not, it's not over. This is just consider it a lesson. And as long as it's a lesson, you might even say it was worth making the mistake. Not that I encourage you to make mistakes, but there is this concept in Latin called the Felix culpa, the happy fault, where if after you've committed a fault, you look back and you learn huge life lessons from it, then it's actually a lucky thing that you made that mistake. Otherwise, you'd never have learned that huge lesson. And life is not about having a perfect success record, never having made a mistake. Don't let anyone cheat you that that is what life is. Because then you'll give up yourself at halftime. You'll say, that's it, I've messed, and we can't start the game over, so it's over. No, it's not. Think of Liverpool. Think of winning the Champions League. Think of the good thief, the last two hours of his life. He redeems himself. So we should all take a pause at certain stages. Maybe you're not all at halftime in your life, as Bob Buffett might say. In Kenya, the life expectancy is 67. So when you're 33, 34, you're saying, I've reached halftime. Think about the other half times in your life. In the middle of the day, you've wasted your whole morning. It's not over. You can redeem yourself, second half. Play it better than first half. Whatever it is, just think about how did I live that first half? What did I learn? And how could I play better in the second half? All the best to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vincent Ogutu, the Vice Chancellor Designate of Strathmore University. And of course, he's asking that critical question, right? How will you leave your next half? the next half of your life as well. It's time to take a stock of how you've lived your first half. And of course, he's given you also a very telling analogy of Jesus uh, betwixt the two thieves and how they entered heaven. And of course, people were shocked because it's all about how you use, you know, the last moments of your lives, you know, the last chance that you do have as well. So how critical is that? Have you despaired? Are you discouraged? Let's hear now from Vincent Kimosop, who is a chief consultant. Uh, the Sovereign Insight also can give us his insight this morning on halftime, the transitions of life. You've got five minutes, sir. Um, thanks, Debal. Good morning, Kenyans. Um, when uh, we reflect on the issue or the topic of halftime, uh, one of the things that uh, I would want to, want to relate to is a story that I would give based on my visit uh, two weeks ago to the city of Geneva. I took time to uh, visit uh, the Reformation Wall, uh, which is on the outskirts of Geneva. In the, it's a wall that they've used to mark the great contributions by uh, people like uh, Calvin, uh, John Knox, uh, people who took time to actually uh, ask themselves that on the things that we believe in, the things that we stand for, what are the implications of this to the very society that we live in? And um, through the wall, they you see the speeches that they gave, the dimensions that they provided to, the, to public life, uh, to leadership. And uh, one of the things that struck me about Geneva is that I do not know the president, I do not know the cabinet, but one of the things that is so evident is that you feel uh, the impact of their decisions on a day-to-day -day life. A very good example is that uh, the, the definition they've given to the dignity of a person. So irrespective of the job that you're doing, 
be it a cleaner, be it a, a, a secretary, all the way to the CEO, uh, they have dignified the life of every individual. That uh, uh, somebody who is even doing providing basic services, like even unblocking sewerages, uh, earns uh, not less than 3,000 uh, Swiss franc. And their definition of uh, really the dignity of a human being is that every man, or every woman deserves to ensure that when they go back home, they can proudly tell their children about what they are doing. They can take them to the best schools. They can live uh, in, in a decent environment. And uh, this really uh, made me question a lot about, uh, even as an economist, the great policies that we have, and how is it that towards the end, they are translating into uh, improving and even changing our definition of what it's it that we call development. And I re want to say that uh, I, I am uh, really now asking myself that it looks like development is not the many skyscrapers, the great roads, however important they are, but what is it that we are doing towards improving and bettering the quality and the meaning of this life? And it uh, really uh, behooves on those who are in places of responsibilities, who are in decision-making uh, platforms, to do things that actually improve and increase and better the lives of other people. I'm now struggling. Even with, uh, uh, for example, programs, uh, the building of big uh, churches, mansions in slums, and asking ourselves, how are we uh, improving and redefining and bettering the life of another person? And I would want to share today, uh, using uh, this platform, that uh, through a book like Halftime, we start uh, questioning that when our time on this earth is over, uh, looking at our tombstone, uh, what is it that we would want to be summarized or written? And now taking a stock back and saying, for me to get there, what are the things, for example, that I would want to, to do that uh, uh, people like Rick Warren have defined uh, uh, on a purpose-driven uh, life? And just summarizing, maybe it is about becoming a better father. It is a becoming a, better, a more available mother, uh, a, a, a CEO who impacts, a journalist who writes uh, stories, as Barack Obama told us, that uh, in future, when we evaluate the stories that we've written, it will not be because of the number of retweets, the likes that we've gotten, but how your stories and perspectives have helped us change, improve, and deepen our dimension and our appreciation of what is it uh, and how do we become better people. So uh, it is uh, through taking that journey and then asking ourselves, summarizing that if I'm to become a better person, a better dad, a better mother, uh, what are the specific things? Just bring down, maybe it is reducing the time that you spend in the office and arriving home early, uh, spending more quality time. It is back to the basic. And when we find ourselves struggling with the basics, that is a good struggle. Uh, I'm, I, I, I know that we, uh, our newspapers have been filled with a lot of stories about how families are facing difficult challenges. But this is a good moment of reflection. I would want to summarize my submission by actually even alluding to what the president said. There's a student who asked him uh, when he was at the m -Pesa Academy, Your Excellency, what do you want to be remembered for? And uh, one of the things that he said is that clearly I want to unite the country and I want to uh, uh, succeed in the fight against corruption. The software issues are the things that we are struggling with as a, as a country. And I think it is important at this moment that we come together and we redefine the basics. I'm happy as an economist, even though we quantify the performance of an economy through GDP, that there is more to GDP. Uh, and uh, when we get the basics right, actually, as a society, we begin trajecting and moving to the right direction. I thank you, and I look forward to the engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent Kimusop, Chief Consultant of uh, the Sovereign Institute, and of course, also uh, just to see what you're saying on social media as well. We have Abdallah Mdambo saying, it takes a lot more faith to move when you are uneasy in spirit, if we may just project that, as opposed to the confident spirit we usually experience, most especially when we are in temporary place of transition or other change that occur, or other changes or changes that occur with us, or with us, with us, other life. If we may project that just for viewers to see what Abdullah Madambo is saying here uh, on air, it takes a lot of faith to move when you are uneasy in spirit as opposed to the confident spirit we may usually experience, most especially when we are in temporary places 
of transitions or other changed or changed that occur with us in other life. This is what he says sometimes. Uh, it's but not very clear. Then we have Samuel Orutra, and he says those little things we ignore in the process of life takes or, or in the process of life talks much about us in society to do the little you can in society and you will be appreciated. Do not wait to be millionaire to impact society, but leave the fullest from scratches to riches with people. Thank you for your comments. We shall be reading much more of them and we'll try and project them on air. I don't know if I've, I'm experiencing technical challenges here, but we do have Daisy M. Danny. She's on the lectern right now and uh, she's going to give us also an insight of that. Half time, transitions of life. Take it away. Thank you, Dipal. You know, when uh, we had the discussion about um, the topic of today, I wasn't very sure uh, about what to talk about um, personally because when you talk about half time, it's a, it's a concept that's generally interwoven into the fabric of our being. Even from when we're in school, we take breaks during uh, the, uh, the, the, the school timetable. You have tea break, you have uh, uh, lunch break. We do that when we have meetings and all. We have holidays, uh, which are supposed to be times of reflection. But um, as Dr. Ogutu was talking, I, I really, I appreciate that uh, you brought us to the point of redemption because um, it is very um, powerful for me because when I think about redemption, I think about myself. And in the Bible, we read about the story of the prodigal son who went and uh, asked his father for his inheritance and uh, went and spent it on very wasteful uh, living. And we are told that he squandered this money, spending it with people, and it came to a point where he had nothing left. And he went and sought uh, employment as uh, he worked with the, the pigs. And he would have even eaten the food of the pigs. And he came to himself, meaning he had a time out. And he came to himself and he looked at this life that he was living and everything that he had wasted. And he said, even uh, servants in my father's house live better than this. Let me go back home and see if I can even plead with my father, you know, to give me uh, uh, an opportunity to just serve him. And his father was very happy to receive him back home and put the ring on him and celebrated that my son who was lost ha has now been found and he has come back. And one of the things that our, the life or the, the, what we are shown about life for many people are only success stories. We're never told about people who have failed or who have had timeouts and everything. And a lot of the thing that we are told is that you cannot, you can restore many things, but you cannot restore time. Time is the one thing that you cannot restore. Yet in the scriptures, in the book of Joel, 225. This is the one thing that Yahweh says that he can do for you. He says, I will restore unto you the years that the locust and the cankerworm have eaten. That he is able to restore your lost time. And I know this myself because at one point I didn't know who I was and I didn't understand who I was. And like the prodigal son, I lived a very wasteful life, you know. And um, it came to that point where I came to myself in salvation and began to ask those critical questions, um, you know, about where is my life heading? How is my life heading? And the minute I committed myself in salvation, repenting of my life, then I began to get direction. Today, very many people come to me and they say they want to be mentored. They want to know how to, you know, how can we work together? But if you saw who I was before, there are many people who would not want to be associated with that person. Um, and, and I know that redemption is real, you know? And this is not a thief on the cross moment, you know, at the end of your life. I have seen Yahweh work in my life and make me productive and help make other people productive and have a vision. And I know that we haven't even begun. 
when we look in the scriptures, we read of people who were used when they were 80 years old, you know? And in many cases, here in Kenya, we say, you know, these are people who should be retiring. But Yahweh has, can make you productive at any point of your life. And what does a wasted life look like? It looks like lost years, um, painful years, years of rejection, years of doing things that mean nothing to you, losing everything, you know? Um, being broken. And there's so many lives out there that are being broken, lost opportunities, lost hope, broken hopes, you know, lack of opportunities. Yet, there is a way out. Time out. You can talk to him who is able to make a way where there seems to be no way. And Yahweh is well able to do this. I remember reading the story, or watching actually the story of a lady, a Zimbabwean lady, called Dr. Tererai Trent. Um, and I watched this uh, earlier on this week. This is a lady who she was married off when she was 11 years old. She was given away for a cow. She wanted to go to school. But uh, she's from Zimbabwe. Her father didn't believe young girls should go to school. Her brother went to school. She would take her brother's books and she taught herself how to read and how to write from her brother's uh, books. And she even used to do her brother's homework. And the teacher used to wonder, your homework is so on point, but the guy was failing, you know, in school. And he wondered, and fa they found out that, you know, the young girl is the one who was doing the homework. She was given away in marriage at 11. By 18, she had four kids. She never stopped dreaming and desiring to want to go to school. She one day met a lady from the Heifer Foundation who asked her what her dreams were. This is a young woman, married, no education, um, four children, an abusive husband who abused her because she had a desire for an education. And she said, I want to go to school. I want to get an undergraduate degree. I want to get a master's degree. I want to get a PhD. I want to change my life. Her mother told her to write her dreams and to bury them somewhere, and she kept on hoping. Eventually, she actually got the opportunity to go to America. She got her, she got her, her high school diploma. She went to university. She got her undergraduate degree. She got her, her postgraduate uh, degree. She got her master's. She went to America with her family, including that abusive husband. He abused her while they were in America. Um, the police got to find out what was happening. He was arrested. They parted ways. She remarried a man who believed in her dreams. She met with Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey, you know, invested in her dreams. Today, she has built schools back home in her uh, native home, uh, Zimbabwe, where over 5,000 children are now benefiting. And this she was able to do when she was older. And so there is, n there is no time where Yahweh is not able to make you productive. And I say this because we are in a country where there are so many people. Because of a lack of vision of the leadership, we still have lack of development. People whose opportunities are snuffed out by poverty and a lack of opportunity to be able to maximize their potential. And so they cannot be that which they have been made to be. The talents and the giftings that are inside them, the dreams that are in them are dying, dying one by one. But I want to say this today, that even as a nation, we need to take a time out. We need to begin to reflect as a nation, who are we? What are we trying to do? How are we positioning ourselves globally? How, what are we doing for our own people? It cannot be that we are constantly looking to foreigners to come, investing for foreigners and not investing in our own people. We're killing our local potential. Don't ring that bell, Debal, because I'm almost done. You are not investing in local potential. We're not creating, uh, enabling opportunities. You know, there are so many people who are looking to go to other countries because they know if they're there, they're able to flourish and, and, and to, 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 to be more productive, and they send money home. We know that diaspora uh, um, re remittance, 
is very, very high, but it's from people being productive out there. Why can't we make our people productive? So I just want to say that we can take individual time out. There is redemption. Yahweh is able to restore wasted years. It doesn't matter how, what, how much time you've wasted. It doesn't matter what you've lost. He's able to restore it personally and even as a country. And so I want to encourage somebody, everybody out there that time out as a country, as a people, and we can turn this ship around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for very much, uh, Daisy and Danny. And of course, yeah, I felt for a moment there that I was in church, encouraging words from Daisy M. Danny. And we're talking about halftime. This is a book that uh, we're drawing our inspiration from. This is by Bob Bufford. Are you taking halftime, of course, to just reflect on your life, where you've been, where you are, and where you're going? What is your trajectory? Are you also having dreams which are not really, you know, working out? And it's, it's, it seems, yeah, my dreams are not coming to fruition and I'm giving up, maybe also I'm getting up in years and yes, what you really wanted to accomplish by now, you've not done so compared to so many people that we normally take a benchmark with other colleagues as well. So this is what Bob Bafford is really talking about. What you want actually to come from success to significance. Maybe you have all the trappings that you wanted from life, but you're wondering, is this all, right? You are the peak of uh, the pinnacle and you're wondering, I'm right at the top, but there's such an emptiness inside me. I just want us now to focus on this discussion with our panelists with a few minutes that are remaining so far. And I think also you laid it very well as a country, uh, uh, as a nation. Sometimes, do you think that we don't take time to reflect? I think just five years back, we were celebrating uh, the 50th anniversary, right, since uh, uh, independence. And uh, that was a pivotal, pivotal moment as a country for us to actually reflect on where we are. At. But it seems we are always on a vicious cycle of electioneering as well. When we take stock of, our, of the politics of the countries, yes, from these elections, we begin for 2022. This, these are the projections. You can read out what is actually on the headlines. If I may pick a daily even today, I think I saw it, I think it's in the standard, right? Yeah, uh, what was that? Yeah, there's just stories about 2022. It was in the people daily, right? So when do we take time to take stock and re-evaluate as a nation. Tizam Wanki. Yeah, in fact, Diba, you mentioned this. We are on this perpetual, endless, election to election, rat race, I call it. Uh, we finish one election with all the tension and all the wasted energy, and all we hear is 2022, 2022. And what is it all about? It is about getting power for access to resources. That is all it is all about. And that is the problem we have in this country. And I think Daisy mentioned it very well. We are devastating our country with this obsession with power and access to resources for personal gain. And we are not going to find fulfillment as a country. We're not going to find fulfillment as individual leaders if that is all we focus on. And we shall devastate this country and our people will be flooding out of this country to go overseas looking for a better life. Just as we know, many Africans are crossing the Mediterranean at great risk and dying in the process because this continent is not taken care of. It. And it's a tragedy. And this half time, mm -hmm. this concept of reflection, yes. we need a national reflection where we change our course completely and change our value system and say this cannot continue. Uh, yeah, and, and the, point, the point I want to make, Dibal, is a very simple one. We have children behind us. When, uh, some of us are parents. What on earth do we bring children for if all we can do is demolish the country for them? Mm. We better stop having them. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that is a reflection we've got to ask ourselves. Let us leave this country better than we found it, not worse than we found it, which is what we seem to be so fixated with. Right. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Vincent Ogutu. I actually like Daisy's uh, example of timeout. I mean, because halftime is one big timeout. But then in games like, say, basketball, at any given moment, the coach can just say, look, timeout. Just give me a timeout. And then he calls the team together says, this is where we're going wrong. If we just correct this tiny little thing here, we have an edge and then suddenly you're performing better than before because of the time out. You took time out to stop, reflect on what exactly was happening and where we should be going and then we do that. Mm -hmm. And now that we're talking of a, a country, I think we need such a concept of a time out. You know, the way we've had in the past 
a national prayer day called let's all reflect on something and pray for peace or pray for unity or whatever mm -hmm. why don't we have like a timeout you know an, an official timeout where as a country we reflect on who are we mm -hmm. what is our identity what are the things we're not ready to mm -hmm. to uh, sacrifice what are the boundaries that we're not ready to cross the red lines and we say this is who we are this is what we can become and want to become we set those targets these are the things we will not compromise on then we lay them out they don't even have to be many they could just be three or four key ideas you know honesty serving others and then we are we are hustlers as well as kenyans you know we can we've got that fighting spirit we can create we are creative innovative so we just take a few labels like honest kind innovative courageous you know like about four or five things that identify who we are we say this is what we're going to become from now on and then we start that journey in the second half but we seriously need a time out as a country we need a time out yeah, you, yeah. You, you hold with this view we'll come yeah, to you David. i i i think I, I just wanted to buttress something uh, as in we 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 talked about uh, the constitution remember that when we get this constitution all our problems will be solved I want to say it is, it has in the constitution has uh, made a great contribution to this country. It has stabilized some things. But you realize the country is yearning for something more. And uh, I think in this period that we are on the handshake or the building bridges uh, phase, one of the things that I would want to really reiterate is uh, that National Reflection Day. And exactly where do we, who, we, who are we as a people? Where do we want to, to, to go? W what are the things that we cannot uh, compromise on? Uh, I, I, and I'll give the example of the French. They have three values that, as in irrespective of who comes on board, those, they remain to, to be the definition of who they are as the French people. So uh, this is the time for uh, a national reflection. And the importance of the national reflection, uh, I would give, I remember listening to Professor Kivuda Kibwana and he said for three years when they began with the devolution, they could not make any progress. In fact, he even pointed out that they even, he got to a place where he has, even though publicly elected as the governor, I led an initiative towards the dissolution of my government because we were not going anywhere. But I, I would want to say that they might not have had a time out, but you can see the impact of a reflection as a people. And since we are in the devolved uh, governance framework, this reflection ought to happen mm -hmm. at the national level and also at the county level so that uh, I, I want to celebrate, for example, what happened in Kakamega. I was very happy with that national celebration, the Mashuja Day happening. You can see that uh, there are things if we reflect on and we get them right, uh, they actually move the country to the right direction. Uh, the hospital they are building. So there are good things that comes out of reflection. I, I think we just need to be more intentional. I, maybe perhaps also, Dibal, now that you've called us for half time, at times these calls could come either from those who are in authority, but also uh, uh, gatekeepers like the media. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I mm -hmm. think it is important like such a conversation mm -hmm. be moved not just for this morning that we will have this session. Staff is here. Yeah. You know, that kind mm -hmm. of taking the, I think it is important that things are bad, uh, we bathed from this platform so that uh, we become part of the solution. It's very easy to be a referee and point out this is wrong. Referees play an important role. We, we don't dispute without them the match. Even he's the one actually who calls for halftime. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is the game is everybody now playing from the coach on the side. Uh, the other comeback, uh, uh, my namesake Vincent, uh, is, is the Manu uh, Bayern Munich match of 1999, uh, Champions yes. League, on the, as in on the edge, and they were able to overturn that. So. Uh, it is possible, and I think I, um, I, I would uh, challenge us from here. Uh, we can progress this conversation. Yeah, time, time, time out. Uh, that is what uh, Daisy thinks that this country needs need to have a robust conversation to reflect, uh, look at the crystal ball where we headed, look at uh, where we're coming from. Right? Yeah, we, we don't want to look into crystal balls. Um, <laughs> 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 we don't want to do that. <laughs> Um, uh, let me say this, <laughs> and I think I, I, it's important to say this, that when you do a time out, the one important component of a time out is that you also must be willing to be honest with yourself, mm -hmm. okay? You cannot have a time out and have no-go areas, 
okay? So if we're to have a time out as a country and a national reflection, that national reflection must be based on honesty and truth, where we're able to open up everything and say, let us have an honest discussion. Mm -hmm. Where are we headed as a country? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? But the national reflection must also be uh, uh, premised on the desire to want to change. Because you see, what we've been doing, Vincent talks about the new constitution, and Dr. Ogutu here has talked about some of what, what are the values that we want to inculcate. But if you look at our constitution, it's actually a very well thought out document. It, has, it talks about those things. It talks about national value, character of leadership, administration of the state, how it is to be done. It is not being done. And because it is not being done, we have a lack of coherence even as a country where we have <laughs> contradictions between constitutionalism, rule of law, and impunity. You know, where all these things, the, the, the impunity manifests even in the face of laid down law and procedure. And then we sit here and we say, oh, what can we do? Yet we have everything available to us about what we can do. So time out, even at a personal level, you can't make changes if you're not willing to be honest with yourself. You can't. And so even as a country, we have to be very honest with ourselves, even looking in at our history because there are so many things when you talk about um i think you mentioned in the book it talks about de-stressing mm -hmm. you know kenya if we were to uh, let's say take the 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 happiness index like bhutan kenya is a very traumatized country we are traumatized <laughs> from independence <laughs> the independence struggle we are traumatized by the political um uh, clashes and, 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 and electoral, you know, strife that we go through, ethnic balkanization. And there are so many things that have traumatized us as a country. Yet, we've never even had time for just healing as a country. You talk about a national prayer breakfast. But remember that the one premise that Yahweh requires for you to go before him is that you must go in repentance. Repentance means that you are reflecting. You are reflecting and you're saying, Indeed, Father, we have done, I have done wrong. I have done wrong. And to repent means to turn away, not a 360, a 180. You were going in this direction, you go in the opposite direction. Is that what, are we willing to do that as a country? Mm -hmm. Because we have heaped layers and layers and layers of hurt and brokenness upon our people as a, as, as a, as a, as a country, you know? So that at the end of the day, really peeling back those layers, meaning that we will have to go through a time of hurt. You know, it's like when you go for counseling. You have to open up. You cry. You vent. But at the end of the day, you chart a way forward. Are we willing to do that? Are our leaders willing to allow us to do that? This is the question that we must answer because that's what we thought Thank Building you. Bridges was mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. the, and the Building Bridges is a perfect time because what it did, we had the the uh, the secession of those uh, you know hostilities you know <laughs> and so it is an opportune time for us to have the discussion but look our politicians are not letting us we are talking 2022 we're talking referendum the law is not what the problem is kenya has actually very good laws we don't need a referendum we said we need a new constitution we have a new constitution we seem worse off than we were before <laughs> you know so now if we get a referendum are we going to be that much worse off so we need to really look at the real problem the real problem is we have a very bad value system we Thank have you. a very broken country we have a very traumatized populace and we really need to ask ourselves what kind of kenya do we want what does it mean to be kenyan because being kenyan we don't even have a national identity Thank you. What does it mean being Kenyan for all of us? Whether I'm a female, whether I'm a child, whether I am not well-to-do, whether I'm well-to-do, what does it mean? We have to have a national character and a national identity. We don't have that. Time to take stock, time to reflect, time to have half time. I know there are conversations, even as we were winding up, like uh, the dialogue uh, contact group, and uh, which we don't really uh, get much to hear what is happening on the ground as well. Is this a conversation that we scale, uh, we, should, mm. we should escalate and maybe take it to on a national level? Mm. You're saying you're beginning maybe with asking the questions, do we need a time to reflect, time out, to just see where we, we have we really taught this constitution, but is it really working uh, for us? Are we all the wiser as far as, you know, uh, living as far as the constitution is concerned? Briefly, as we're winding up, uh, we hear from uh, Dr. Caesar. Yeah, uh, 
we keep hearing of, of dialogue group and all this. The challenge we shall always have in this country is what is related to capture of power, mm -hmm. right? Where everybody else is out there and there are few people who decide what the happens. Deep state. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And that is a problem. The, I think Daisy has hit the nail on the head. The challenge and what we should be discussing is what values do we have? What values should we have? And what should I, at my position, and everybody at a personal level, what should I change to contribute? And what behavior should I have to contribute to a better country? That is the discussion we should be having. And not this, all these convoluted uh, issues about dialogue groups and, and handshakes, which are all very good, at least they help cool the national temperatures. One simple example, I was on the beach at the, in Mombasa this week, and I met a young man. He was selling key holders, mm -hmm. and he was selling them for 200 shillings. And I, I didn't have money, so we got into a conversation. Yes. So he told me, I'm 24 years old. I went to school. I cannot get a job. Mm. Today, I have not sold a single key holder. And I still stay at home because I cannot take care of myself with my parents. And my parents are very poor, so I cannot even take them 200 shillings at home today. And I have six other brothers and sisters at home. And he told me there are many of us like this mm -hmm. in the coast. You understand? Now, that is a problem we have. Too many of our people are marginalized. What can we do to, to make the lives of our people better? I think that should be the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Vincent Ogudu, briefly as we're winding up. Yeah, so as we think about the national thing and what can happen, there's the risk of always shifting the burden of action to somebody else. Like, when will the leadership ever embrace some of these ideas and start doing them. And then we sit back complaining when in fact each of us can take control. And in Bob Buffett's book, he says part of what happens at halftime is you realize that I'm actually in control. There are things I can decide. There are things I can do. And I should start doing them now. So you take back control of your life. So this is our country. Don't wait for somebody at the leadership level to do something. Take back control yourself by the way you live your life, by the commitment you show to the calling that you have, the purpose that you have. And don't worry if the first half was bad, if you made mistakes, you can always pick yourself up. Life is about beginning and beginning again, and just beginning again. Thank so you. nothing is lost. Take back control. Live the life you want everyone else to live. Don't wait for anyone else to do it for you. Thank you. Daisy, your parting shots, briefly. My parting shot is that, indeed, we do need personal reflection but I also want to say that it is time also for the leadership to reflect within itself because you cannot be a leader and absolve yourself from any kind of responsibility of transforming a nation. That is why you are a leader. You have the instruments available to you, the resources available to you to actually transform the nation. But as the people, we need to also reflect and understand that these people are supposed to be working for us. And as Kenyans, we need to come back to ourselves. What can we do, including taking back our power and demanding accountability from our leadership in terms of making our, our lives better? Thank so you. we should join in these conversations. Thank you. And I like that conversations are having, but let the people be part of that conversation. It cannot be a secret society somewhere within the deep state deciding that let's craft this conversation to hoodwink the people yet again. Thank you. Vincent Okutu. Um, uh, Vincent uh, came us up. Um, <laughs> yeah, namesake. Uh, I, namesake. Oh, wow. Uh, I, I would say that in the good book it says that it is time to go back to the crossroads and think and ask for what are the right parts that we need to work in. And I really want to uh, say that when I read uh, about the nation, for example, this media house, it, uh, it was to contribute towards the nation building. So I think, uh, Dibali, if you can actually escalate also this conversation all the way to your boss, it is, I think it is, we cannot be deferring. I am challenging uh, my brother Vincent here from Strathmore, as in Daisy and as in even myself, Caesar, that it is also one thing to point out that, hey, things are not going this way. Thank but you. even more important, if we also ourselves change the conversation, says, guys, uh, we want to be part of the solution. And uh, may we really now, beyond this uh, discussion, Thank you. Uh, have the half time taking place. Right, thank you.